Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Shpresa Halimi, Research Assistant Professor with the Institute for Sustainable Solution. This is our second lecture in the, our seminar series focused on ecosystem services. Uh, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I have a couple of announcements. Uh, I would like also to welcome the uh, online audience and all the students and the community members um, who are here tonight or are watching us live online. As you may have heard, due to inclement weather, our speaker wasn't able to drive down from Tacoma. We are lucky to have him screencasting live to us here, and he can take your brief questions after the lecture. Please come up to the microphone. Uh, we do realize that this class ends at 6, so some of the students might have to leave at 6. But if there are questions, there are many questions, we can stay. We have booked the room until 6.30, and our speaker is willing to take the questions past 6 o'clock. Uh, for those of you who are um, going to submit the weekly reviews, Martha Works, sitting back there, uh, we'll collect them uh, probably uh, after the lecture. You can hand them in to Martha. Our tonight's speaker is uh, David Becker, and he is with Earth Economics. He is, has been an ecological economist for more than 20 years. He is well known for his collaborative approach to solving complex multi-jurisdictional and transdisciplinary challenges. As founder and executive director of Earth Economics since 1998, Dave has completed over a dozen path-breaking ecolog ecological economic studies that have changed policy at the international and local levels. He has worked in 35 countries on environmental issues and ecosystem services. Most recently, Dave has been developing accounting strategies for the natural capital of public utilities, designing a framework for institutional watershed management and coordination, and engaged in the development of new economic measures of happiness, trade, and international finance. He is uh, regular, uh, regu regularly invited to attend the World Bank and International Monetary Fund meetings with finance ministers from over 150 countries, has participated in the Climate Convention, and serves as an expert advisor on many technical boards, including the Loss Avoidance Methodology Focus Group for FEMA, and uh, Floodplain Management Policy and Program Investigation Committee. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dave Batker. Well, thank you, everyone. Dave, you are on. Thank you. Well, I wish I could be there in person because I love Portland, and you've got a great group. But So I'll be down there before the end of the semester, I am sure. Uh, but today... I'm going to share sort of the introduction to, ecolo to uh, ecosystem services, which perhaps we were supposed to have as the first lecture, but I couldn't do it at that time. But there is something new, I think, in this presentation for everyone, uh, because we are really on the cutting edge of a lot of these issues. Uh, Earth Economics is a nonprofit. We were founded in 1998. Uh, We've worked on a huge number of studies. Here are just a few, one on the Nisqually, north of you. Uh, we looked at valuation of Puget Sound. Well, gaining ground was the delta of the Mississippi. In fact, I was at Louisiana State University when Bob Costanza was there, and I studied with uh, Bob and Herman Daly as well. So it's very exciting for me to give this presentation and share with you the cutting edge of ecosystem services in their application. And what I want to share with you about that is that Bringing ecosystem services into economic analysis transforms economic analysis and how we do investment. Everything we invest in from built capital to education to how we look at other issues. I'm going to talk about those things and how we apply ecosystem services to public utilities, conservation, fisheries, um, flood protection, and a variety of other issues. Core to this is the topic of tonight's presentation, 
valuing nature. And um, first, I wanted to give you a little bit of the big picture before we talk about valuing nature. Um, and that is, just think about the advancement of economics. Prior to the 1930s in the US, pretty much we had microeconomics. And that's looking at markets, um, supply and demand, households, firms, and how they relate to each other. OK, that's fine. Um, that's important work. But then in the 30s, we had something else happen. We had this huge national crisis on a scale that microeconomics does not act on, the nation. So we had unemployment, uh, old folks who didn't have food. In fact, young kids who didn't have food, crisis of factories and capacity to produce, but all closed. And so a new economic paradigm was really born, and that is macroeconomics. And what that did was say, the scale of economic analysis is not just the market, it's not just the household or the firm, it's the nation. Let's look at the nation. And with macroeconomics, we got, consider this, a new set of goals, for instance, produce more stuff. That was never a goal before the 1930s. In fact, we had no measures either of gross domestic product inflation, uh, the money supply. We had no, no measures at all of those macroeconomic um, um, goals, to reach those macroeconomic goals. So we got new goals, new measures, new policies, like agricultural policy, industrial policy, even educational policy, social security, and new institutions to manage those things. The agriculture department was expanded, et cetera. So when you change the scale of economic analysis, when you bring in something else big and a new set of goals, then you need new measures, you need new policies, you need new institutions. And so we've titled ourselves Earth Economics because we think we're at sort of a third stage, again, in the advancement of economics as a whole. And that is um, economics, if you look at the economic profession, macroeconomics did not include the planet. It didn't include climate, looking at water supply, limited oil, et cetera. All these now revolve around a new set of goals, something that I think is at the core of Portland State and certainly at the Institute for Sustainable Solutions, and that is sustainability. How do we actually deal with ecological and social sustainability? So if you have a new goal, it means you need new measures, new policies, new institutions, new funding mechanisms. And that's sort of the scale that we're working on. Well, in the past, we've looked at the economy as sort of the big thing. And the environment has a little bit of a small thing. You've probably seen slides like this uh, from Bob or Ida or others there at uh, PSU. But in reality, this is the reality. Every economy is set within a landscape. And it's why land use planning and the wor urban work at, at, at uh, PSU is so important as well. If we don't have an economy that is compatible with the environment, we're going to have a collapse. And we don't have to look far to find that. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But if you think about what makes us better off, well, there are really several kinds of capital. There's built capital. That's all our stuff, our cars and tables and chairs. There's social capital, how we get along with each other, our communities, our laws, our nature. That's worth a lot. If social capital falls apart, well, you end up more or less in a Somalia situation potentially, except communities are still held together. There's still valuable social capital even in Somalia, but not at a national scale. Then we've got human capital, our skills, our education, our knowledge, self-worth. Those things are so valuable. I'll talk about one of, the, for instance, the issue of how do you measure things like self-worth in an economy? We're working on the Hanford um, Nuclear Reservation right now uh, with four, several tribes. And they've asked the question, if this land wouldn't have been contaminated, if our salmon wouldn't have been lost, would we have the social problems we have now? So if you think about ecosystem services and the services provided by natural systems, even things like human self-worth are tied in with those natural systems. And how we include that in economics is a very complex set of problems, certainly worth an Eigart PhD um, dissertation. And then, of course, there's natural capital, all the benefits we get from our natural systems, whether it be our cli safe climate, 
fossil fuels and minerals or our ecology and the from photosynthesis all the way down the food chain. So I wanted to emphasize these four things, which are crucial to eco ecological economics. Often the first three are really highlighted and sort of the bottom one is left out. So ecological sustainability as a critical goal, rights. For instance, do I have the right to emit toxics and pollute your body? Maybe not, although today it seems we do have those rights. Valuation. How do we look at the allocation of goods and services? How do we produce and decide how much natural system we need out there to maintain biodiversity for future generations, to maintain flood control, drinking water, et cetera? So valuation is tied with allocation. And it may not be a dollar valuation, but when we decide to blade something un under uh, for a new housing development, or we decide to set aside a national park, whether dollar valuation was involved or not, that certainly is an implicit valuation. And finally, governance. If we don't have a solid governance structure, then it doesn't sort of matter what your goals are for ecological sustainability or rights. They may be violated and fall apart. We've been working in a number of countries where um, rights are very crucial. And if you look at the United States today, one of the biggest debates is property rights. And I would put it to you that ecosystem services and the analysis of ecosystem services holds a key to refining property rights. What are private property rights? What are our commons? What is our common wealth? And what are certain values that flow through natural systems like drinking water that uh, transcend individual property rights with property boundaries. So let's go into ecosystem services. I'll give you a quick um, analysis of a few things here. You've probably seen some of this, but well, first I wanna show you what happens if we don't pay attention. This is New Orleans. Uh, these are the wetlands of the Mississippi. Bob may have also showed this, uh, shown these to you. In fact, I think here, Josh Farley had these original slides. Well, we've lost 1.2 million acres of land um, in Louisiana. This is 2020 if we continue to lose. Well, if the landscape degrades and falls apart, you can't have an economy. A cities can't be maintained. Businesses can't ma be maintained. And so this is what happened in Louisiana. I was there for five years. I worked also with the Louisiana Geological Survey looking at this, canals dug in for oil drilling, which allows salt water up and destroy the, the natural wetlands. And then what happens with climate change? We got hotter. The Gulf is uh, significantly hotter than it was 30 years ago. This is the track of Hurricane Katrina. It was a mere tropical storm before it entered the Gulf. The waters of the Gulf are so hot, even if it started cooling today, it would take 20 or 30 years to cool down. So it's like a match uh, to a, a gasoline for a hurricane in there. And you can see the path. Well. The hurricane was significantly degraded by the wetlands. It went from category five to basically between two and three by the time it hit New Orleans. But that was with the, after the loss of 1.2 million acres of wetlands and um, nowhere near the hurricane protection coverage that New Orleans had 100 years ago. And so I was there right after uh, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, I was called in by my old colleagues in Louisiana to help out. And you can see a barge in this is the ninth ward. 1,400 people lost their lives here. Huge amount of infrastructure destroyed. All of those houses, 80% of the city was flooded. This is the loss of ecosystem services. It, they have real economic costs. About $200 billion if you take public and private costs, both insured and non-insured. And then here was our flood this year. We had to open all the gates. And you can see the sediment plumes, that plume down on the right at the Mississippi River outflow, that sediment is useless. It goes off the continental shelf. The sediment up above by New Orleans and down by the Atchafalaya River, that sediment is building new land, building, rebuilding wetlands, providing greater hurricane buffering. The only way is to open up these areas with new, um, uh, with new um, diversions and provide greater capacity to produce ecosystems and ecosystem services. So if we don't do things right, even here in the Northwest, things are gonna fall apart. 
So let me talk a little bit about ecosystem services. You probably know food, recreation, carbon sequestration. This is None of this is new to you, I'm sure. Water supply, pollination, medicinal resources. I love that photo down on the left. That's taxol. Right in my yard, I have a, a yew tree that's about 250 years old. Across Oregon, by the way, I was, I'm originally from Washington State, but I spent a little while in Oregon when my dad was going to school down there as a kid. And um, across Oregon and Washington in the Northwest, we slashed off millions of acres of yew trees. They were piled up as slash and burned up. It cost us money to get rid of yew trees. Then, about 40 miles from my house here, the University of Washington tested the bark of the yew tree. Native peoples had always used the yew as a medicinal uh, plant and found taxol, the cure, one cure, not a complete cure, but the best known cure for breast cancer and a number of other cancers. Consider that's worth billions of dollars every year. That's the value we can measure in dollars. But think about the value of children having their, their mothers alive for more years, of the extended life of women who have breast cancer than their husbands and partners. So the value that we can measure in dollar value is very small, in fact, to the true full value, whereas uh, for other economic assets, it, it may be different. So goods are things you can drop on your foot. Remember that. <laughs> you can drop goods on your foot. And ecosystem goods include food, water supply, medicine, fiber, fuel, minerals, carbon. Those are goods. Now, putting a dollar value to nature and ecosystem service is a rather debatable topic. And we get criticism from all sides. Uh, well, in the past, that was greater, not too much anymore. But my friends on the environmental side say, you should not be putting a dollar value to natural systems and nature. And um, I think of it like this. Really, we should not put a dollar value, say, to a person's life. A person's life is in, has intrinsic value, and you can't say whether rich or poor or anything else, one life is worth more than another. But we still pay people for their work. We pay attention to work that they do. That doesn't say anything about their intrinsic value. And natural systems are similar. At least we could keep track of the food that natural systems produce. At least we can keep track of and value the flood protection. If we don't value those things, then we risk destroying them and having tremendous costs, just like Louisiana. So in the case of goods, we can value these things because they're sold in markets. Medicines are sold in markets, food are. These are excludable goods. If I eat an apple, you can't eat an apple, <laughs> and we can trade. Services are different. Services are things that you cannot drop on your foot. So. The term ecosystem services, some of us have a little trouble with that because they're both ecosystem goods and services uh, when we talk about ecosystem services. So services are things like flood risk reduction, glass and gas and climate stability. We call these sort of regulating services, services that regulate how water moves, the quality of water, et cetera, sediment transportation. Now, this is worth a lot. Think about Portland or Seattle. Our water supplies are provided by utilities where they don't have to build a filtration plant because the water is filtered, filtered by the forest to a quality higher than any drinking water standard. That's fantastic. We don't have to build a plant, have that capital cost, and have the plant fall apart again, and then build another one. So Seattle, for example, to build a filtration plant to replace this natural service of the Cedar River watershed would cost about $200 million, and it would last for maybe 40 years. Whereas we've got a forest that's been there for the last over 100 years providing our water and filtering it, and it continue, can continue on into the next 100 years. That's water quality, just one of these characteristics. And I want to share with you that we've been working with a number of utilities, I'll get to that case study, to change accounting because Though you can value and have on your asset sheet the uh, filtration plant, that watershed for producing all that water that we drink is worth nothing. It's only worth the great, the bare watershed for Portland, for Seattle, for San Francisco, for New York, for Eugene, for Vancouver, for Tacoma, Washington. All those watersheds that provide that water have only a value on their books 
as bare land and timber value. Zilch for producing and filtering water. We're working to correct that. And we'd love to have an Eigert uh, or any other student uh, contribute on that project. So these are regulating services. Now I'm going to talk about supporting services. Biodiversity and habitat, nutrient cycling, primary net production. Sometimes you see these services grouped differently than what I have here. And in fact, we're working. We're, go ahead. Oh, really? Oh, shoot. Okay. Absolutely. Is that right? Hmm. Maybe it's my fancy. I've got some kind of fancy stuff here. Maybe that is not um, working. Thank you for telling me about that. Um, let me see if, tell me if these slides come in. Did you, just one moment. Did you see the slide with um, the eco list of ecosystem services? Okay. Hmm. All right. How about services? Is that coming through? Okay, great. So these are regulating services, and we can value these. There are methodologies, just like uh, for water quality, we can look at the replacement cost uh, or avoided cost of the uh, filtration plant. So there are methodologies for valuing this. Supporting services or functions are even harder to value in many cases. For instance, nutrient recycling. Can you see this slide okay? Can you see my uh, supporting function slide? <laughs> okay, I don't know why it is not moving forward here. Oh, probably. Okay, so the next slide will be, it's coming through? Okay, great. So these are supporting functions, pollination, biodiversity, habitat, nutrient cycling. When we come to the valuation, I'll explain how um, we look at these things as sort of an appraisal. Some of these values, like nutrient cycling, where would we be if um, our wastes and uh, nutrients like nitrogen and carbon were not cycled on the planet? We'd be in a big mess. But how do we value them? Well, there is really no good methodology yet because these are essential services. Uh, finally, cultural function, aesthetic value, re recreation, cultural value, spiritual and historic, science and education. Now, some of these can be valued like recreation and aesthetic value. If uh, a house has a view of Mount Hood, then you can, you can take the hedonic value, that extra value, and uh, place a value to it. If it's, um, if it, I don't, I may not have a house that has a view of Mount Hood, but I get aesthetic value anyway, that, because I can see uh, Mount Hood when I take a walk. So again, aesthetic value of Mount May Hood may be partially captured by valuation, but not fully captured. Why are these things important? Well, there's a lot of very nitty gritty, hard problems to deal with. And um, we're working on the Hanford Reservation and oh, the Yakima tribe and a number of tribes have said, we have lost cultural value in these areas. How can we be, is it possible to compensate or is it possible to clean up? What happens when a, when a burial site is radioactive and you cannot visit that site and it's important spiritually? How do you compensate that? Perhaps it's not in dollars. It might be in some form of restoration or other form. But these, what I want to kind of point out is that more and more, there are some very significant and real problems that can only be addressed by ecosystem service analysis, whether it takes the course of valuation or not. And, um, and so if you go into this as a field, you're going into the right field. It is a growth field. So finally, let me look at some flood risk reduction cases. Okay, this is Pakistan. If you can imagine, uh, 18 million people affected by that flood. It's a fun Oh yeah, okay. Let me, try sorry, I have. Oh, okay. Let me try it again here. Um, one moment. 
sorry, I should, I'm just going to flip through the slides here. I could probably, so anyway, let, I'll flip past the Pakistan slide in any event and just bring you up on, uh, So if you think about it, you know, a hundred years ago, we were short of things like roads, indoor plumbing. This is when our economic measures were created. For example, the GDP, measuring how much stuff we produced. On the other hand, now we're not short of asphalt and plastic toys anymore. We're short of things like flood protection, climate stability. We're short of um, drinking water in a huge number of areas. So. Can you see this now? It says Tolt River Levy Setback. Oh, okay. Let just wait for a moment. I'll describe this slide and let's see if it comes through. So, um, in in many cases, doing the right thing in a watershed means it will cost a little bit more, or um, from traditional economic analysis. But in fact, it's far economically uh, more advantageous. So in the confluence here in Washington state, in Western Washington, between the Tolt River and the Snohomish, we have a lot of flooding. We need to do salmon restoration. We have water quality issues. And uh, so we looked at a very practical project proposed, a levy setback. For flood protection alone, it didn't add up to enough dollar value to to for a five million dollar investment for salmon restoration alone that levy setback would not add up or for water quality but when you start looking at the dollar values that you get from increased salmon habitat flood protection water quality then the project looks very very good as you add them together can you see my slide yet you can okay great so this is the um this was the area before we did our economic analysis and the line of the levy. You can see it's very constricted. Uh, this was the proposed levy. Uh, the economic analysis did justify moving the levy out. Interestingly, yep. uh, and then here, after the project was completed, in fact, it did absorb a huge amount of floodwaters. And it was a very successful um, Chinook habitat restoration project. They counted, I uh, forget how many reds uh, in the core area for Chinook salmon habitat. So these predicted benefits actually came true. The, we did the analysis in 2004. I think the project was completed in 2008. This was a flood in 2009. And um, this is another uh, view of the site. So this was very important. Um, it reduced flooding in the neighboring town. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, valuation and how we do valuation. Why is it important to do valuation? Well, if you'd like a budget for whether it's Department of uh, Environmental Quality or for a project for restoration or anything else, we're dealing with dollars and an investment in dollars. And I think the conservation movement has been at a huge disadvantage because often it's said, well, okay, thanks for 50, you know, $5 million, here's how many trees we planted. Whereas the road, in the road analysis says, okay, well, here's how many million dollars we provided in new transfer in transportation uh, value. And so if you if you don't look at valuing things in dollar value, if you don't need investment, then probably it's just fine. But if you're out there competing uh, with other investment choices, then it's pretty important to show what kind of rate of return you can get. And what we've found in watersheds is that you can have a rate of return of about six to one, six dollars for every one dollar, if you're looking at the combined benefits of, for instance, flood protection, salmon restoration, water quality, recreation, and such. And that means that uh, restoration is a very good investment indeed. This is the Puyallup River watershed. Uh, that's the Port of Tacoma below, if you can see it, and Mount Rainier. Uh, in the distance. It's a very steep watershed. Flooding is a huge issue. It's the most armored river in Washington state. That means they've poured a lot of concrete on the side of it. Um, the first step of looking at an ecosystem service analysis is looking at all your e a suite of ecosystem services. 
if you can see this slide, that's on the left. And then your land use types, rivers and lakes, wetlands, and riparian forests. I'm going to talk about the much debated uh, benefit transfer uh, analysis. And frankly, I don't find that there's too much to debate about it anymore, even though all the issues are valid. But um, this is more like you need to think about benefit transfer as an appraisal, like a house appraisal and a business appraisal. And we use house appraisals and business appraisals every day of the year. Tens of thousands of, in fact, millions of these appraisals are conducted um, how, if you talk about house appraisals uh, every year. And they have the same problems. Does, this, does the house, is the comp reasonable to co compare with the area here? Is it too far away? Uh, are the values different? Uh, there are some judgments. So, but um, I'm happy to report that this methodology, the federal government, we had a meeting last year uh, with chief economists from several agencies, as well as a good uh, a group of academics in Washington, D.C. And uh, one of the folks who was the past chief economist of the GAO said, well, in fact, it's not perfect. It's got all the problems that the critics say, but it's as good as anything we use uh, when it comes to flood protection for valuing houses or businesses or anything else. So we should move forward with it on a, as a practical basis. So our first step, if you can think about this, in the Puyallup, we had 14 land cover types. I only show three here. First step is identifying whether an ecosystem service exists or not. So we lay that out. Then, are there studies within the region, within the basin, that um, you can put a dollar value to? And we use sort of the lowest range in the um, academic literature and the highest range. And this really follows upon Bob Costanza's work, um, even from 1997, his nature paper. So he uh, really led the way on this um, methodology. And we've made some refinements as well. Oh, OK. Thank you. Uh, can you see this next slide now with total? low value of rivers and lakes. OK, I'll just wait for a minute. But um, what the slide you're about to see is simply totaling up those values. I think my uh, I have two fancy slide transitions here, and that takes a little bit of a uh, bandwidth. So think about this as an appraisal. You know, you value you can value the bath. How many bathrooms does your house have? How much is here? What kind of flood protection does it provide? Um, and then. We cannot value all the ecosystem services, but we can value some, and that's better than zero. Now, there are many critiques, which, in fact, I think are, I was one of the biggest critics, in fact, of this methodology, and um, those things are valid. But often, we are forced with um, using something practical, and so we try and reduce the errors and, uh, and problematic aspects of it, but push forward with the usefulness. So here, if you can see, we can sum up, say, habitat refugium values, water supply, aesthetic and recreational value. Not everything, because there's water flow regulation value that wasn't uh, uh, estimated, and get a larger value. And that is just okay. Yeah, let me try that. All right. Um, so ecosystem services, again, let me just, um, I'll have to escape out. Can you see my screen now? Be a better way. To, sorry about this uh, technical difficulty, everyone. Hmm. That's odd. OK, I'll unshare and share again. Thank you for All bearing right. with us. We do have a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, and uh, Martha is going to upload it on the uh, desire to learn. So you, uh, the students will get the slides. Thank you.
Okay. Good. So can you see this? Uh, you can see my slides there. Oh, sorry about that. Now I'm back to the beginning again. I meant to, uh, but yeah, let me just uh, try this if you can see it all right. Um, one moment. So uh, for the Puyallup, yeah, we looked at these values. And then if you look at these values per acre across your land use type, this again is not an exact evaluation at all. It's simply saying, let's get an appraisal of our natural capital. How much is it worth? And typically we've looked at, when you look at the lowest possible value for um, say flood protection and the highest value, and you total up those lows and highs, what we've found, for instance, for the Green River uh, Valley, which is where Boeing is, Seattle, huge built capital assets, it's about $75 billion in built capital asset value. In terms of ecosystem services, it's somewhere between 35 billion and uh, 140 billion. So it's somewhere between about half to twice the value of the built capital. And one of the reactions of um, one of the folks from the Chambers of Commerce initially was, are you kidding? That's crazy, it's impossible. And then we went through our values and finally you can sort of total it, this up as this ne next table shows, agricultural lands, um, pastoral lands, and such, the dollar values across each one of those have anywhere between three to 14 ecosystem services valued. Then you start saying, okay, well, we're providing each year between half a million, and we actually round these figures, uh, this table, I don't know why we don't have it rounded, uh, to about um, $5 billion. That's a huge range, but that's because there is a lot of uncertainty when you do this sort of appraisal and we don't want to kind of hide that uncertainty. On the other hand, you can make some significant decisions when you start saying flood protection is on the order of you know, tens of millions of dollars per year, we'd better take care of that natural capital. So there are two things you can kind of do with that. The annual services provided within the Puyallup watershed of the wetlands, forests, even the marine waters, rivers, lakes, uh, shrub uh, areas, about a high of 5 billion to a low of 5.26 million. We know they're both underestimates of the true value because um, we have a lot of ecosystem services we haven't valued. And secondly, you can then look at that flow of value over time and say, okay, the natural capital within this basin is about $120 billion to $13 billion in terms of, um, of uh, present value. Why is this important? Well, I'll tell you some very practical reasons why it's important. Um, if you look at decisions about levees and flood protection in this basin, the Puyallup, or around Portland, we've, we, what we've said is if you incorporate Army Corps and county, both your natural capital and your built capital in flood protection analysis, then you can see where your, the most value is being provided. And you can invest perhaps in a longer rotation of forest lands, greater duff, so that you actually soak up more water, or you make sure that areas with more permeable uh, soils are in good, healthy ecological condition so the water doesn't just run off and create greater flooding. So there are a whole new uh, vision for flood protection. And in this basin, we've spent a couple billion dollars on flood protection and it hasn't really, hasn't performed well. And uh, so the next billion or so we need to spend right. Um, and FEMA has taken this very seriously as has um, the Army Corps of Engineers. Now, um, I'm gonna quickly go through a few more slides here as I wanna leave some time for uh, presentation. So I'm gonna, we did a sim similar study for the Puget Sound Basin. Um, and when you start valuing natural capital, then you get some new ideas because just as in the depression, for instance, this nation was a nation of dirt tracks in 1930s. So we set up funding mechanisms for at the city, county, state, and federal level for roads. And we have spent trillions of dollars on roads. And we've got a pretty robust road system in this nation, probably the best in the world or close to it. Um, 
On the other hand, when it comes to investing in natural capital, we don't have any funding mechanisms. And so here in the Green River watershed, as I was talking, I was mentioning, Seattle is here. It goes all the way up to a very rural town, Black Diamond. Um, this is the Green River Duwamish, broken into a few different parts. We looked at the valuation of ecosystem services and said, in fact, we should have a funding mechanism of about $300 million to rebuild the natural capital, including salmon restoration. Astoundingly, all the Republicans elect these mayors and such of 16 cities from almost Tea Party, Black Diamond, down to Seattle, were unanimously in favor of these ideas, of this idea for water and shed investment district where you would um, bill out based on the service provisioned for beneficiaries. So think about this. All those ecosystem services, flood protection, storm water, uh, drinking water, et cetera, you have provisioning assets, whether it's forests or wetlands, and they're different for each ecosystem service. Then you have a suite of beneficiaries, like the people downstream benefit from flood protection, but those upstream, they already have flood protection, they're on the hillside. And then also those who impair, in the case of flood protection, you may be putting more water into the river. So it's reasonable to say, well, what we want for a funding mechanism is we want to bill some beneficiaries, we want to bill the impairers, and then reinvest in the provisioning assets. And those assets for flood protection might sometimes be levies, but might also be moving levies out or investing in forests and wetlands. Now, this is more efficient. Just strict speaking strictly as an economist, not as an environmentalist, you're going to get more value, you're going to get better flood protection and service out of this structure than you're going to get out of building one stormwater system in 16 or 16 stormwater systems that put water into the river and then you go oh geez we're getting greater flooding we need these le levees higher and then the levees wash out and you're losing your salmon because the uh, contaminants in stormwater so this perspective uh, for the watershed investment district and we have drafted legislation we were hoping it would go forward this session it seems as though it's not going forward yet in this legislative session, but salmon recovery, fresh water provisioning, flood risk reduction, stormwater management, uh, habitat restoration, uh, climate adaption, and payments for ecosystem services would be wrapped into that. I'll quickly go on to a couple of other examples where valuation is very important, uh, valuing natural capital. As we mentioned, Seattle Public Utilities, just like Portland, when you turn on the tap, it's forest filtered water. Unfortunately, if you want to build a filtration plant, well, you go ahead and put out a bond. You can raise the money because that $200 million of the filtration plant are going to show up on your asset sheet. And because it shows up on your asset sheet, you can raise your rates. But if you decide, hey, I just want $20 million, a tenth of that to remove roads, guess what? Your asset sheet goes down because roads are assets. Forests are not assets unless they're just as lumber. So there's no value for that uh, in accounting, which means it's kind of hard to raise a bond when you're not actually increasing anything on your asset sheet. Investors don't like that. So we've gone to the Government Accounting Standards Board and said, we need to change this. And big utilities, including Portland and uh, San Francisco, New York, have joined Earth Economics, and we have a working group uh, to change these accounting rules. This is huge because it would change accounting rules not just for utilities, but for all local government agencies, period. So you'd have to look at your forest and say, does this provide drinking water for people? Well, maybe we need to protect it. Next step would be looking at um, groundwater, which is not considered an asset. Just to give you a few other examples, besides accounting, we've been working with um, the Obama administration. They're looking at their principles and guidelines for cost-benefit analysis. Uh, every federal project, that is required, even Department of Education, Department of Health, is required to have a benefit cost analysis to show that this project is going to have more benefits than costs. Well, nature doesn't count. Nature is unvalued in current benefit cost analysis. And that's why the Army Corps invested probably about $40 billion in levies in Louisiana and very little toward wetland restoration. Now, uh, they realize that's very flawed. So another, so 
benefit cost analysis is going to be reworked, hopefully this year, the whole guidelines and principles that will uh, be uh, will impact federal agencies. I gave a presentation to the uh, national um, uh, President Obama's um, Council for Environmental Quality, which is putting this together, and then it'll go to state and local agencies. Environmental impact assessment. We did the first e EIA. Uh, environmental impact statement, which included valuation of ecosystem services. And that was important because this is a restoration project on Smith Island here in Puget Sound. And it showed that, yeah, not only environmental impact assessments are not only to say this is good for the environment or bad for the environment, but it should be able to say, yeah, you can justify that investment as well. And then it fits with rate of return calculations and such. We did the first green jobs analysis, which is a broader approach if you look at Oregon, Washington, California, a lot of states have done green jobs analyses, but they look at green jobs as sort of niche markets. In other words, you need to be planting trees, doing organic agriculture, renewable energy, uh, retrofitting houses for energy. In fact, our view is that if you're producing the greenest paper out there, it's a green job. This is sort of a moving bar and it involves all industries because we need a green economy, not just uh, a, a little niche market. The first place that paid off was last year when we worked on uh, funding mechanisms for state parks in Washington state. They've cut the entire budget for state parks. And so we went out and said, well, okay, here's how many jobs you're gonna lose, not just the state jobs, but in rural Grays Harbor County, you're gonna lose 392 jobs because those people with trailers and those Oregonians coming up to visit our parks are not gonna spend their money here. And suddenly there was bipartisan support for a funding mechanism. And there, recreation, ecosystem service provided by parks, we laid that out in its connection with jobs. And uh, the funding mechanism was approved, and even the, the governor said she'd never seen so many people in favor of uh, one single uh, tax increase. So rate of return on investment, funding mechanisms. Basically, this is why valuation of ecosystem services, though it may be um, unsavory at times, is in practice very pragmatic and practical. So I'll tie up my presentation there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you can check our website at www.eartheconomics.org for our list of studies. We just completed a green building study, a number of others, but I'd like to take some questions while we still have time. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. And now we can take some questions. Um, please come up to the microphone, and Jenny will help with repeating the questions just in case that Dave didn't hear them. Yeah, Hi, uh, this is Mary Vogel. I'm with the Congress for the New Urbanism, Cascadia chapter. Um, you mentioned uh, that ecosystem services was a great field, a growing field to be in, and I just wondered if you could say more about that. A lot of the people here tonight are students, and um, you know, I, I'm wondering what you know about, the, uh, like, um, where do you find um, ecosystem services courses? Would it be in economics departments or, um, you know, s some other places? Great. I think that's a good point. Well, Earth Economics, even we are hiring. I mean, despite how bad things have been, we're doing quite well because people need these services. Federal agencies are a good measure, and um, it's astounding between five years ago and today, these, uh, there's a thing called ACES, the, a conference on ecosystem services, and whether the new units within Department of Agriculture, um, U.S. Geological Service, the Forest Service, just on and on, federal agencies are bringing on ecosystem service analysis, the EPA. And then we've seen 
Um, we're a small nonprofit that's kind of pioneered this work um, uh, in a lot of different areas. And consulting companies have been approaching us nonstop um, to assist or you know learn more about these issues. And they are definitely expanding their work in ecosystem services um, on a variety of areas. And schools, well, I think you're at one of the best places. Um, Portland State, unquestionably, uh, this is, I think you're an epicenter of ecosystem service analysis. Typically, um, most economics departments don't have ecosystem services uh, as part of what they, they go through. Portland State is, I think, very important and unique. And also, this is really multidisciplinary work, so it has to be in a multidisciplinary um, approach and University of Vermont, University of, um, uh, well, there's Stockholm, there's the University of Maryland, of course, Portland State, a number of universities are moving in that direction. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm Kenneth Lyons in the Master's of Environmental Management program. And I have a question about your uh, watershed district. Uh, I can't remember what you're labeling it. But um, you're working to integrate payment for ecosystem services. And I'm just wondering, you know, what your methodology is there when the benefit transfer method isn't spatially explicit and how you're going to correlate, you know, PES across the landscape then for especially different services and different levels of provisioning of those services. That's great. Thank you for that question. Yeah, in fact, we've been working with, um, there are a number of models, I didn't show them here, to look at how you get at spatially explicit value. Uh, and that's crucially important, I think, in the long run. On the other hand, um, for many of our taxes, you know, you pay a property tax and all we know is that you have property there and we put a value to it. Whether that value, how accurate that value is, is kind of hard to tell until your house sells or the land sells. So if you look at our, our um, payments simply for services, whether it be um, any kind of tax, stormwater or otherwise, uh, it's a pretty blunt set of methodologies. So I agree the best method would be, for instance, in Louisiana to say, look, here are these ecosystems, here's how much flood protect or hurricane protection this area of wetlands provides and we can map it, we can value it, and now we can set up a very detailed um, funding mechanism, payment for ecosystem services. On the other hand, I think we'd better not wait until we have all that information to set these mechanisms up. Uh, because, for instance, hurricane protection for a particular acreage of wetlands depends on the aspect of the hurricane, the size of the, the um, storm surge, uh, a whole variety of very complicated um, uh, variables. And so often it's better to send up a slightly blunt system, which works, rather than kind of wait for the perfect system. And I think Costa Rica is a brilliant example of that. Uh, they tax gasoline, water, a little bit of a flood tax, and they've reforested areas. Do they know that the areas reforested have provided exactly or equal uh, flood protection or drinking water value? They don't know. But it seems things have improved greatly. Uh, which areas are providing the most benefit? Not quite sure yet. But those are refinements that can come along as you develop the system. And so that's the kind of framework that we're using for the Green River. Oh, one other thing. Yeah, go ahead. Next question. Okay, so for, for example, for pay, the Green River, we actually proposed 25 different funding mechanisms for the Watershed Investment District. And in truth, politics counts a lot. And so they may choose something, for instance, with flood protection, where we can better model and map the values. On the other hand, they may go with uh, pretty much a property tax in the short run just to say, look, guys, we've got, if we rate 10 more years to get a funding mechanism set up for our natural capital, it will have fallen apart even further. So it's more urgent that we get $30 million in it every year, and then we refine it so that it's fairer and better. And I think that's the path that we'll see a lot of jurisdictions take. Finally, I wanted to mention also, 
I wanted to be down there to be able to sign my book for those who would like it. But I have a new book out called What's the Economy for Anyway? Uh, Why We Should Stop Chasing Growth and Start Pursuing Happiness. And that book is available on Amazon, etc. It just came out in November. And uh, John DeGraff, my co-author, we've had great reviews. And it talks about a variety of other things, happiness, uh, what are our real goals? And, of course, the sustainability piece is the biggest chapter in the book. Um, I had to give that little plug. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, my name is Camila Stark, and I'm a, um econ undergrad. And I, you mentioned about your green building project, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Great. Thank you so much for asking that question. Um, much of what we need to do is not like fix nature. Nature is fine on its own if we give it a chance, if we don't wreck it. Uh, much of what we need to fix is us. So our transforming our built infrastructure to sustainability and to not damage critical systems like our drinking water and our, and our biodiversity is crucial. So, and the good news is that we pretty much rip down or rip out the innards of all of our built infrastructure every 30 or 40 years. That's just the way the economy works without any focus, you might say. And so we worked on why is it that green buildings are so much more expensive than toxic, unsustainable, damaging buildings. As you can guess, it's because of the externalities. But our report, which I think is on our website, is very different from the traditional green building report. What we said is, how do you look at the investment model that a developer has? So whether you're a house developer or a commercial building developer, you have a um, rate of return investment model that you use to decide what materials and how to build your building. We want to start with that and say, here are the variables that we need to turn. In other words, toxic materials need to get more expensive. We need to, if you're going to get rid of your stormwater on your site, then perhaps you need a greater credit for that rather than being built just the same as an impermeable surface. And how many of those and to what degree do we have to, to fix those incentives so that all investments, whether private or public, are going to move toward green and a better infrastructure. That doesn't solve the problem that we need overall, like city and county planning that's better as well. Uh, that's another piece. But what we were looking at specifically was what are the policies and incentives needed to start changing our, the, the investment in our built infrastructure. In the Puget Sound Basin, we'll, probably, we'll have easily $200 billion invested whether it's people putting a new you know, room on their house or asphalt or, or a giant new highway that the state puts in. And these investments need to be guided <coughs> excuse me, by better and new incentives. Thanks. <coughs> my name is Olivia Walke, and I work at Cardinal Entrix. I'm an economist there. And my question is about international projects you've worked on. Could you talk about some of your biggest challenges with international law and... Um, who's primarily funding them? <clears throat> Thanks for that terrific question. I was there, uh, this dates me very well, but I was at the first PREPCOM meeting for the Climate Convention back in 1991, and then I've been at a couple of con recent conventions. One problem is that <clears throat> we view the environment as legal agreements. So we have what are called multilateral environmental agreements. That's the climate convention, the CITES for endangered species. There are about 30 of those environmental agreements. And yet what we really need, the problem is not, let's get a legal framework internationally. Much of the problem is we need a lending arm that's the size of the World Bank to shift investment from the wrong things to the right things. And right now the investments are in the other direction. So on one hand, you have investing institutions, private banks, public banks, national banks, export credit agencies, um, multilateral banks like the World Bank. They're using one set of uh, rate of return 
uh, policies and calculations to allocate investment, and that's to helping destroy the planet. And then on another arena, you have environmental, um, multilateral environmental agreements, which are largely powerless in moving investment. Uh, the ozone, the case of the Montreal Protocol was good because we sort of did the right thing. We phased out CFCs, although we phased in some pretty bad stuff for for climate and HCFCs and the uh, ozone layer. But I think unless we come to grips with the fact that we need a new framework that integrates both the law and the the policy and investment, we're going to have a very tough time. And um, And I think that We've also siloed issues, like Tony Lavinia, who's the head negotiator for the RED in the Climate Convention, is one of my friends. He's a Filipino, um, and he chairs it as a government representative. And the fact is that you can't ignore biodiversity, water quality, and all these other ecosystem service, services only to say, you know, in the Climate Convention, we need a lot more plantation forests because we just have to sequester carbon that would also be too narrow and a wrong path. So we have a very, very serious problem. I think a lot of people recognize it um, on the international and national scene. But what is the governance structure that can change this? I mean, we have the institutions. Uh, so I, I could talk for a very long time on this question, but I'll, I'll kind of wrap it up with this. Just like in the US, we still have 1930s institutions. The Agriculture Department of the U.S. is really a 1930s produce more stuff and we'll give you more subsidies <laughs> agency. Internationally, we have the World Bank, the IMF, and the WTO, which evolved from the GATT. They were 1944 institutions, World War II institutions. And are they, do we need to start recasting these institutions and the same with the multilateral environmental um, agreements. I think we can look at governance that is strong. And I think in, I've got a lot to say about that topic. But um, I think there are some good ideas about funding mechanisms and I, wild ideas like uh, the Sky Trust and things like this. Their time has come. We need to um, look at these more carefully. And if the World Bank or other institutions are not contributing greatly to sustainability, maybe they need to be phased down and we need to phase new ones in, or they need to, their charters need to be changed to emphasize that they will abide and support the conclusions of the Climate Convention. And, um, and then, of course, you have all the roadblocks within the conventions. So anyway, I'll hold up right there. Otherwise, I'll talk for another hour. Um, hi, I'm Courtney. Um, I am a cartographer with the biogeochemistry background, but uh, my question has to do with sort of how you make, um, you know, to politicians or the public in general is how you make a, sort of your pitch, because often what you're, you're talking about in terms of ecosystem services, you know, things like, you know, bee pollination and all that is they're more like long term issues like, you know, 20, 30 years down the road. Do you um, you know, face resistance, you know, from people who say want more like stimulus packages, shot in the arm type of economic development? Great question. Again, um, I think that we have to make ecosystem services are the new development vision. And it really does displace macroeconomics. This is a very big statement, but, um, and how do you pitch that? Well, I think you have to be very pragmatic. You don't say that. What I usually say is, you know, if you lose an ecosystem service, you gain a tax district. So we used to have wide enough floodplains and there were farms there. We didn't need to have a flood district. Now we put a bunch of houses down there in industry. Now we're stuck with a flood district and building and maintaining levees. Storm water used to go into the water and into the river, and we were fine. Now we've put all this impermeable surface, so hey, you got to have a tax district. When you start laying it out like that, that in fact um, our natural capital is worth a lot and we get greater service by investing in natural capital, then unexpected allies just straight from, they don't may not care at all about the environment, 
But when you lay it out that you get greater service for your dollar investment with natural capital, then they, they start coming around. But I think on the broader piece, the answer to your question is really taking a look at the book, what's the economy for anyway? Um, I think there are a lot of things. People really don't care about the GDP, and yet our stimulus was set to increase the GDP. And was that really a good goal? In fact, it didn't even do a good job for that because, you know, people got bought cars with the car dis with the big uh, car subsidy that were Hyundai's or Hondas. Well, it some stimulated a different economy. Um, and I think that this vision, a, de a full development vision like rural America, has not had a positive development vision since the 1930s. Rural electrification education, all those things came around. Particularly since the 1990s, there's been a real steep decline in income in rural America. And the, the economic message out there right now is, hey, you need to work harder for lower wages, fewer benefits, and forget retirement. That's a pretty sad economic vision for a country that's the wealthiest nation in the world. And for workers who are more productive than we were 10 years, 20, 30, 40 years ago, we actually have more wealth. So there's something wrong with that vision. We need, we need a vision that says you can be happier, consuming less, trading for greater leisure time, and uh, such. And that's sort of the focus of our book, looking at policy. And that, that was one of the good reviews, we, uh, several of the good reviews that we've had is the focus on uh, positive policy and a vision of a better economy rather than trying to hang on to what's deteriorating. Thanks. Okay, great. Well, if, uh, if there are any more or anything, let me know. And I am going. I am going down to Portland State. You will, if you come, at some point. I'll give another talk down there in this spring. I have to be there. I have to see you all. I can't just uh, be at a distance. So thank you so much. for. I hope this is worth it. You bet. Yeah, and I really wanted to thank Supressa and uh, the team there. She did a great job of putting this together. I really was planning on going down there, but it was impossible with all this snow. So... Uh, the Institute for Sustainable Solutions is just fabulous, and uh, every, I wanted to thank everybody who helped, helped put it together. And thanks to you know, Bob Costanza, David Irvin, uh, Linda George. You've got such a good group, group down there. It's really wonderful. If I was a student, I'd be going to Portland State. You bet. <laughs>